Welcome back to Warning 56K. Today we'll be going over a very affordable starter home lab server that can be had for under $200. That's right, a rack mount one use server for less than three months of YouTube TV, the HPE ProLiant DL20 Gen 9. I'm going to try to cover as many bases with this chassis to try to give you as much information as possible without going too far off the rails. Without further delay, let's get started. Released in 2014, the HP ProLiant Gen 9 series spanned 11 different models, ranging from the smaller power efficient 1U DL20 up to the powerhouse 2U DL2000. While being very power efficient and an excellent starter home lab server, they do come with some caveats that we'll cover to make sure that you don't get stuck with something that you regret buying. Within the DL20 Gen 9 series, HPE offered 13 different pre-configured models in the 1U form factor, but all were based on just two different general chassis, the 4SFF featuring four 2.5 inch front bays and the 2LFF featuring two 3.5 inch drive bays. So whatever DL20 Gen 9 you find, it'll be based on one of those two. So if you can, decide early on if you want two 3.5 inch drives or four 2.5 inch drives. The servers are also very short at only 16 inches of depth, so plenty of room in even the smallest size home racks. We'll start off with the processors. Of all the DL20s, all were powered by Intel's Pentium Core i3 or E3-1200 V5 or V6 processors. While being very power efficient, they can be a bit lacking if you're looking to have a multi-core powerhouse, such as with the Intel Xeon line of processors. The lower end CPUs, such as the Pentium and i3 processors, only have two cores and four threads with only three megabytes of L2 cache. So there's not much brute force in that department. On the other hand, the E3 1200 V5 and V6 processors are a bit more forgiving with four cores and eight threads, as well as eight megabytes of L2 processor cache available. So easily double the virtual machine capability. Unless you found a smoking deal on one with a Pentium or i3 that you can upgrade, definitely opt for one with an E3. Out of the 12 E3 processors that the DL20s can come equipped with, half are V5s and the other half are V6s. The only variance within the V5s is operating frequency and power consumption. And the same goes for the V6s. What makes the V5s different from the V6s is that the V6s are more power efficient than the V5s by about seven watts. But the larger difference is that the memory runs at a different speed. 2133 megahertz for the V5s and 2400 megahertz for the V6s. So if you're upgrading the processor, be aware that you may have to upgrade the memory. While on the processors, there's another caveat when moving from a V5 to a V6 processor. Many users have found that they lose voltage from an entire RAM channel after upgrading to a V6 processor. A BIOS update is required to resolve this, but HP has yet to release any notifications of having to do such. RAM. The DL20 Gen 9s are powered by DDR4 unbuffered ECC memory. Again, they support either 2133 MHz RAM for the V5s or 2400 MHz RAM for the V6s. It can accept four UDIMs in two channels for up to 16 gigabytes in size for each stick, but having a total of only four RAM slots limits the amount of memory that they can hold, which is at most 64 gigabytes total. So, not exactly a RAM capacity beast, but more than good enough for a starter VM home machine. CD-ROM drive. A CD-ROM drive was standard on the performance models, but was only an option on the regular models. The one that I have here, for example, that I've been testing and using, does not have a CD-ROM drive. For the PCI Express side of things, you have three options available. Either a dual low profile riser with two horizontal PCI Express 3.0 X8 slots, a flexible LOM riser for the LAN on motherboard capability that includes an additional X8 slot, and then a GPU riser with a single X16 connector. The DL20 Gen 9s do not support bifurcation, so you're stuck with using a PCI Express NVMe adapter with only one NVMe per PCI Express card. Another option is to add a dual PCI Express M.2 SATA card to give you internal SATA capability through the PCI Express but the drives still have to have their own dedicated SATA connection for each NVMe. The DL20 Gen 9 has dual front USB 2.0 ports, 
dual rear USB 3.0 ports and a single internal USB 3.0 port. What's nice is that you can use the internal USB 3.0 port to boot from. Even though I didn't have a PCI Express NVMe adapter handy to boot from, I went ahead and made a Clover boot USB just to see if it would at least load. And it did. So, that makes me believe that booting from an internal PCI Express NVMe without SATA support should be possible. But I might be wrong. Video. The DL20 has one rear VGA port for video. Onboard video is driven by a Matrox G200 supporting up to 1920 by 1200 resolution. So nothing spectacular. As far as the BIOS, BIOS updates with HP can be a bit of a hassle. HP keeps the latest BIOS versions locked down unless you have an active service contract, only making the critical updates available for free. If you do some searching online, you'll eventually find the latest BIOS versions that you can download from some random website. Just be careful what you download. Make sure it's the right version you need for your right model, because you can really mess some things up if it's the wrong one. The DL20 Gen 9s also have a redundant ROM for the BIOS, which maintains two copies of the BIOS stored in case of an issue. Run into a problem with the current BIOS, move the jumper on the board, and it defaults to the stored copy. A very nice feature to have. ILO and Ethernet. All models had at minimum dual Broadcom gigabit Ethernet, the first port being shared with ILO. ILO to HP is iDRAC to Dell. ILO stands for Integrated Lights Out and is HP's embedded server management tool, which provides multiple ways to update, configure, and monitor the server remotely. You can load BIOS settings, mount an ISO, check hardware, most everything you can do with Dell's iDRAC. Even if you don't have a current service contract, ILO is still available for use. ILO has a shared Ethernet port with NIC1. The DL20 Gen 9 has a single micro SD card slot on the inside, but it is not hot pluggable. So never attempt to replace the SD card while the unit is powered on. You can use this card to boot ESXi, but SD cards are known to have a higher failure rate. So that's not recommended even though you can do it. What some users have done is add a SATA DOM SSD module to boot from that connects to the CD-ROM SATA port for much faster boot times and better reliability. The only downside is again, the limited power connectivity within the DL20s. So you'll have to mad scientist a bit to make your own splitter adapter to give it power. HPE makes a cable kit to adapt for additional power, but I've yet to see any pictures or part numbers for it. Storage controller. HP offers two options for storage controllers. The standard models got the Dynamic Smart Array B14i, and the performance models got the H240 FIO Smart Host Bus Adapter. Both models having the ability to provide RAID 0 stripe, RAID 1 mirror, or RAID 5 striping with parity. Both controllers are not true hardware RAID controllers and only support software RAID or fake RAID. The B140i can be run in RAID mode or configured for SATA and AHCI mode. It supports at most 600 megabytes a second for each drive and does not officially support SAS, only SATA. The H240 can run in RAID or HBA mode or host bus adapter mode with HDDs or SSDs and is the only one that supports SAS drives. One caveat with both cards is that they are only software RAID, again. They do not support data protection. Driver support for the onboard controller can be a bit spotty with certain operating systems and hypervisors, so many users tend to add their own HBA or host bus adapter or RAID card to connect to the existing drive backplane. I do want to stress again that driver support can be a pain in the ass under certain situations, even with Windows Server. So get ready to possibly spend some time searching online for drivers in case you run into an issue. I will say though, that while testing this particular DL20, I swapped in an old 240 gigabyte SSD drive with Windows 10 already installed on it, and it actually booted up with no problems on an entirely different system. So I was kind of surprised. Internal SATA. There's two onboard SATA connectors, one labeled SATA NGFF for an internal PCI Express M.2 SSD and the other labeled SATA ODD where the CD-ROM drive or another M.2 SSD would connect. The DL20 has three fans total, two front intake fans directly hitting the CPU and one center fan for cooling the PCI Express cards. There's a spot for what looks like an additional third cooling fan right next to the CPU fans for cooling the RAM, but I haven't seen any pictures of that spot being occupied. The fans get momentarily loud doing post, 
but do become much quieter after settling down. The latest firmware version quiets down the idle speeds a lot, and I mean quiet, near silent. There's not really any need to add additional fans in this unit. Startup test just to let you hear how loud it is, which it really isn't. still stepping down even more and it's about almost near silent yeah it's just making a slight hum I don't know if you can hear it but yeah this is a really quiet server I swear power supply the standard DL20 Gen 9's come with a 290 watt power supply while the SSF chassis had an optional dual redundant 900 watt power supply. Power consumption varies, but usually hovers around the 30 watt range. Internal power. Standard internal power supply taps such as Molex and SATA are non-existent inside the DL20 and rely on proprietary connectors and splitters. So that limits adding any internal drives without the proper adapters. Probably the biggest pain in the ass with this chassis. ESXi 7.0 U3 is listed as officially supporting the DL20 Gen 9, so no additional driver should be needed depending upon what additional hardware you have installed. I haven't attempted to install ESXi version 8, but something tells me the CPUs will most likely halt the installation. I'll be giving an update in the future to let you know how that goes. Well, that's all we have for this episode. I hope you found at least some of this information valuable, whether it's now steering you away from a DL20 Gen 9 or perhaps made you want one even more. If you like this video, please give the channel a subscribe and the video a like. And as always, thank you for watching and stand by for the next video.